is on the call as well, and he can answer questions uh, offline as well, uh, directly in QA um, and in chat. Uh, we've had some great chat sessions happen in these as well. Um, uh, myself and Tim and and Michael and all of us will be there. So Michael will be up high in the chat to, to him as well. And then at the end of the, web the webinar, we will uh, actually have a survey. This is kind of more of a live stream. This is more of a chat than a webinar. Um, uh, we'll have a survey, so please do help help us provide feedback. We got great feedback from the last session. I hope this is as valuable as that one. Um, and then a recording will be available after the event. Uh, typically, with it pretty quick. I don't want to like give it a, give a, a an estimate, but uh, you know we'll get it up on our our YouTube channel as well. Uh, you know, part one of the series is actually already up on the Cockroach Labs YouTube channel. So just Cockroach Labs YouTube Google search and then go to videos. And it was like the cap theorem part one, which was we talked about consistency last time. It was a fun session. So so uh, let's just get started. Uh, my name is Jim. I'm Jim Walker. I'm in product marketing here at, uh, at Cockroach Labs. Um, I was an engineer. I was an Inks major. I coded professionally for about seven, eight years. And I am intrigued by uh, cool tech and and all things kind of algorithmic or theoretical and kind of how they apply to our systems and what we do today. I, I landed at Cockroach because I just believe this architecture is right. And I, I, I'm a, a student at this point of, of distributed services. Um, and I, I just think some of the stuff we're gonna talk about today, I hope you are equally as uh, interested in it. Uh, on Twitter, I'm just at James. So I am there. Tim, are you with me as well? Are you off video? There we go. I'm with you. I'm always with you, Jim. I know, I know. Lucky me, right? So do you want to give a quick introduction as well? Well, hey, everybody. Uh, Tim Vale, head of sales engineering or solutions engineering here at Cockroach Labs. I, I dual majored in MIS and finance at uh, the finest university in the South. That is, of course, the University of Georgia. Um, so happy to be here. Happy to stretching my skills here to talk about the CAP theorem. But uh, it's, it's an interesting topic and one that does, in fact, come up quite a bit when we're out in the field. So happy to happy to be here with you. Well, thanks, Tim. And, and it is a little bit of a stretch from like an academic point of view. Yeah. Right? Like I think, you know, but but yeah. like, honestly, the, the, the reason I love doing these things with you is you bring a very good kind of uh, pragmatic view to, to how these things actually play out um, in real situations. I mean, I think you and the team are, are talking to hundreds and thousands of people about these these real problems, right? So yeah, yeah. So so we like to have a little bit of balance. I'm a little bit of a student of history as well, by the way. So we'll, we'll get into a little bit of that. Uh, but before we start, people like to ask us, they, they ask us to do this. Uh, and this was actually direct from feedback. This is uh, intermediate type material. Look at, I'm no distributed systems expert. I think Tim is kind of, maybe he plays one on TV. Um, I'm curious, I love tech. Uh, I believe that this is the stuff that careers are made of. Honestly, I think that this is where things are going get into distributed systems, learn about these algorithms, you know, go code Raft or Paxos or something. Go, go read about these things, you know, read the papers that I'm gonna to refer to. Um, but our goal here is really to provide a high level context for this important concept. Like I, 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 you know, like I'm not a professor at CMU, I'm just a marketing guy at Cockroach Labs. And so, um, so this is really part two of a series uh, in three parts. We're gonna talk about availability, CAP, Consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Uh, I think partition tolerance is two weeks away. So, um, so a quick recap. Uh, if you want to go check out the last video, JP just put the link into the uh, into the chat. Don't go now. You want to check out this one, but just give a quick recap. And and I'm not going to spend too much time here. I would really go go check out the first session, and I get really deep into the history. But the, just the story really is that you know we reinvent ourselves as an industry a lot. And this has been going on for 50 years, you know, going all the way back to Fairchild, Fairchild Semiconductor, you know, these eight guys started Intel, right? That started a whole spur of personal computing. Xerox, the Palo Alto Research Center. If you, if you aren't familiar with PARC and what happened there, Windows, uh, the mouse, uh, you know, everything that has become like the Mac and Windows and all these things started there. Everything that, you know, Steve Jobs bought. DEC and the DEC Research Center, just a, a massive, huge things around risk architectures and, you know, supercomputing. But I got to go to Google and really what's happened over the last 15 to 20 years at Google has created fundamental change across everything we do in computing, but I would say as our society and as people, because some of the things that have been invented uh, over the last 15 years have really changed our lives. And I, 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 I have to put these guys up on a pedestal, but Jeff Dean and Sanjay Gamawat, if you don't know who they are and you're in computing and this space in general, just, just go read about them. Um, you know, MapReduce, Bigtable, GFS, 
Spanner, TensorFlow, uh, you know, these are massive, huge things that are making huge, huge, huge impacts on us. And these are the two people that actually, their names are on all these things. Uh, and there's a whole group of people at Google that did this, including, you know, our founders, uh, you know, Spencer, Peter, and Ben, or Peter, Spencer, and Ben by the picture here, um, you know, early days Google, all employees in the mid 300s, you know, like Spencer and Peter worked on Colossus, uh, you know, Ben was working on Google Reader, you know, they were front row and working side by side with these people who have really changed our world. And so some of the concepts that have come out of Google over the past couple of years are, are really changing the way that, that we think about things. Think about Kubernetes and, and, and the impact of that on, on the way people think about infrastructure today, right? Um, there's, this, there's this term called Giphy. Google infrastructure for everyone else is this thing that this Alex Polvey, who founded CoreOS, used to talk about. Um, but these are the, the technologies that are, are shifting these things. And, and I bring that up because there's another person that originally was at a company called Inktomi. And if, if you're familiar with Inktomi back in the early 2000s, what, a, what an important company from a research point of view as well, like their push towards search and, and, and everything that happened really spawned a lot of the stuff that happened in the Hadoop space. I remember there's a guy, Eric Baldschweiler, who worked at Hortonworks with me. He he actually worked at, at Inktomi. There's a lot of stuff that kind of came from this, but Eric Brewer has been one of these people who has been pushing distributed systems and an inventor across the board about a lot of different things. Um, I, I, like I said, in the first version of this, y'all, I, I give a, a lot more detail and history and, and useful links around some of the materials that I think are, are really important to go and, and comprehend and read and I find them to be intriguing, but also very educational. A lot of this stuff is available. Um, Google publications, you could search for Eric Brewer, you could look, look for you know Jeff Dean, Sanjay Gemawat. There's some really interesting things. I like reading these papers. Um, actually, the cap theorem is, came about from Eric and, and it was actually originally called Brewer's theorem. Um, it's called cap because honestly, it, it just goes through consistency availability and partition tolerance as its three kind of core principles. We'll come back to that. But it's been with us for a while. It's really been with us for the past 20 years. And we've been building around it for really quite some time. Um, again, the history of all this is in is in the first session. So let's get into the cap theorem. Um, and we'll just we'll fast forward, right? So so basically the cap theorem states it's impossible for a distributed data store to simultaneously provide two out of three guarantees. You know, I always like the triangle. I remember the triangle, the simple, fast, and cheap thing, right? Like if you're going to build something, I could be simple and fast, but it's not going to be cheap. I think it's it good and it's good, fast. Good, and cheap, that's, I'm it? sorry, good, fast, and cheap, Tim. You're exactly. Same basic concept, but it, it, when it comes to data in a distributed system, because of the physical nature of the data, where the data lives, there is a different way of thinking about things. Like when data lives in a single server, I don't have to worry about availability because there, I don't have to worry about a, a part like it, it going down and having access to this thing because, well, it's just one server. I just have access or I don't, right? And so from a kind of legacy data point of view, you wouldn't think about these three things. But as we kind of, you know, hurdle towards this distributed systems and distributed thinking, and I think we're all moving in that direction, uh, these concepts that are present in the CAP theorem I think are applicable in the way we think about data stores for sure, but I think in the way that you think about code and the way that you think about your applications and what's going on and, and, and how things actually all work together across you know, multiple instances of services. And so what we're talking about is you can't have two or three of these guarantees. Now, consistency being basically every read receives the most recent write or error or an error. Availability, every request is gonna be responded to. And then partition tolerance, basically saying that, you know, uh, some, some things can be dropped, but the system is gonna be there, right? It's gonna to continue to operate no matter what happens. Even if there's like a network connection, like a backhoe comes and takes something out, it's still gonna work, right? And so in more detail, basically consistency is like, if I ask two instances of this distributed data store, the same question, I'm gonna be guaranteed to get the same exact response every time. That's consistency, right? So is the data being re returned no matter who I ask the same exact thing? If I ask Tim what time of day it is, and you ask me what time of day, you might get different answers. I don't think we're consistent all the time, Tim, but I, I, you know, but there's a lot of other questions you could ask the two of us to be different too. But in a distributed data store, consistency is really important, especially when it comes to what the data is that you're storing. And we had a whole session on consistency uh, in, in, in the part one. Today, we're gonna be talking about availability. And basically availability is saying you'll get a response. Right. The data available is everywhere, but you may not be guaranteed to get the same exact data if you ask two different systems. 
But if you ask Tim a question right now, you're gonna get a response. You're gonna get, you're gonna ask me a question. You're gonna get a response. We're definitely available, right? All right. And then there's kind of partition tolerance, which is a little bit different than the other two. Um, and it basically says, look, if, if two requests are made from different sources, they get different nodes, and these, these nodes are disconnected, they're still gonna, the, the system is gonna continue to function, right? Like you're still gonna have access to it, right? Um, this is a little bit different because consistency availability really kind of come back to uh, the same thing around data, whereas the partition tolerance is one of these kind of foundational elements that, that basically drive if you're gonna choose to be consistent or available, right? And, and let's talk through that, right? And so if you think about the cap theorem, right, it's one of these two things, when you're gonna get one of these, two of these three guarantees is gonna be available to you. Now, typically when we talk about the, the cap theorem, definitely with customers and in the industry, we'll talk about different types of database. There's a CA database, consistent and available. Well, that's not partition tolerant, right? So basically consistent and available just means like your, your Oracle or your Postgres or MySQL. It's like a single servant, server. Like the, the whole point about a partition tolerant is that you're taking away the distributed nature of, of the concept. And that is the very soul of what we're talking about. So you wouldn't really talk about a CA database. That's basically a legacy database that has vertical scale sitting on a single server. Partition tolerant is when you are distributing these things across multiple different things. That is the, the, the very nature of what we do. Um, you know, we talk about AP databases available and partition tolerant. So I can leave, I can lose something, yet systems will still be available. Tim, you come across these things a lot, right? Who's the, the, the AP type databases people talk about? Oh gosh, you know, it, it, you're so right. I mean, we, we talk about this a lot and, um, you know, AP, I think a good example, it's not listed here, but like one of the ones that by default, you know, operates more of in an AP mode is something like a Cassandra, Apache yeah. Cassandra, you know, where I, I'm going to, I'm going to send you something back. I'm not going to make a guarantee that it's right, but I'm going to send you something back when you make a request. Uh, so we, we encounter that quite a bit in, in our discussions. Um, you know, how are you different than Cassandra? Well, this is one way we're different in that uh, we, we approach the cap theorem slightly differently by default. Right. You may not get always consistent data. It's like, it's like a Mongo thing. Yeah, you're gonna be eventually consistent. You'll hear that, right? Like you'll have like different isolation levels in a database. Well, that all comes back to this theorem ultimately, right? Like you aren't guaranteed that transactions are gonna be correct. And so if you err on one side, you can't be all three. So in distributed system, you're gonna be AP database or you're gonna be CP database. Mm -hmm. When I think of CP database, like, you know, Cockroach, we really erred on the side of optimizing towards like low latency, consistent transactions everywhere. Like the speed of light and, and consistency is, was our choice, right, Tim? I mean, I think that's what, that's what people turn to us for. So, um, so there is kind of, I, when I think about cap theorem, ultimately it kind of ends with these kind of two different database systems, CP and AP. Yeah, it really is. I mean, the way I think of it, and you've, you've essentially said this, but the way I think of it is given that um, there is a partition, something has gone, gone wrong in a distributed system. Do you choose consistency or availability? You can't choose both, but given that you know, there is a partition, choose one. And that's an important distinction. It's important, as we said before, to really understand what these two things mean in theory, but also in the real world. Right. Because it has, it has an impact. It, and it really does, Tim, and it, it goes beyond like, okay, so y'all, we're building a database where this stuff is actually, like it's everything. If you're out building or designing and architecting distributed systems that are microservices and you know API-based and they're all talking to each other, when you start thinking about data, these are some of the concepts that I think are really important to understand because they will actually uh, you know, have an effect on your architectural decisions, the application architecture, like in your code yourself, you're thinking about these things. And I think that's the interesting thing about distributed systems and some of the, some of the concepts that, that are now kind of at play in, in our heads in terms of a, you know, software development point of view, right? So, um, so we spent a little bit of time there. Um, you know, today we're gonna to talk about availability. Um, and, you know, look at, so the funny thing is like, okay, so Tim and I just went through this long diatribe about their CP, AP. Well, you aren't just going to ignore consistency if you're an AP database, right? You aren't going to just ignore availability if you're a CP database. You're going to do a whole lot of things to actually get as far as you can. It's just that you're optimized for one or the other, right? Like there's still, I mean, the concept of distributed systems 
is that you're designing for scale. The, the concept of resilience is just built into this, right? And so there's a lot of things we do in Cockroach that actually allow us to get to a pretty, pretty good level of availability. Um, it's just that it's not 100%, right? And I think that's the other thing too. There's a range of the third factor, if you will, right? If you're CP, there's a range of A. If you're AP, there's a range of C. We talked about eventually consistent. Can you get to 100? No, right? If you're AP, can you get to 100 in availability if you're CP? I don't think it's possible. And that's where the theorem was proven. And I think that's what it is. But there are ranges um, in the third factor that you would actually look at. Now, there's some things that we do in Cockroach. I'm going to go through um, just to give a couple examples of like how we actually get to this. There's some cool choices we made uh, from a design point of view to implement these things. Anybody who's been through a storage talk with me or the architecture talk has seen some of these concepts. I'm going to wrap it up into a couple other things by the end too. Um, so you know, ultimately in a, in a traditional database, you have a table and you just keep appending rows to it and you have an index and the index tells you where to go get that table, right? Like where to go get that row. I want ball. Well, it's at this memory spot, which was just after glove, right? That's how things are actually stored. That's the important part of indexes. You have secondary indexes, lots of different things. We, we take a fundamentally different approach. When, when we actually, we actually are implemented as SQL. So you interact with Cockroach as SQL, but underneath the cover is this layer where you're actually writing stuff to disk. We aren't just appending each row. Um, we're actually breaking things down into KV, into key values so that we can actually move things around because our memory locations for our data are moving all the time. They just literally, they, they can move every second. They may not, but they could. And there's thousands and thousands of these ranges. Basically, think of them as shards, many little shards, 256 megabit sized shards of a, of a table all over the place. But when we write things, the K is basically the table, index, key, and a column name. And then the value is the value of that column, right? So here's a simple table. It's a dog's table. If I, gosh, I've gone through this example a hundred times, right? Um, and so if I write the first record, it's Carl. Okay, so his, you know, the first K is dog. With the, with the key and then the column name and then Carl, right? D table, column or key, column name, weight, 10.1. And we just start appending all these things and we append them into these things called ranges. And so, you know, ultimately underneath, what we're doing is we're creating this huge sorted space of, of keys that, that basically we can now sort. So I actually understand where to insert things. I don't just append at the bottom, I'm gonna insert into the right spot basically based on the K, right? It's gonna this, this, this monolithic lexicographically by key ordered space, I'm gonna insert into the right space. So when we insert things, right? Or a table gets broken up into, here's a dog's table, here's some keys, right? We have three ranges. We put an index structure because you have to find these things. This is much like a B tree. So if I'm gonna find a record uh, figment, I know to go to the first range, which is that I think yellow or orange. Um, and so we, we do this, but when I wanna insert a record into a range, I go through that index, I go to the red index, I wanna insert Sunny, there's space, great, I can insert that, great, I had space. What Cockroach is smart enough to do is when you insert the next record and I've run out of space, it says, wait a second, I don't have space, uh, what do I do? It automatically splits that range, right? So it's basically just sharded. It created another 256 megabit shard and just ran that. And it will actually consolidate these things over time if you get too many empty shards and all these things. So it lots of- not that anybody probably cares. It's actually 512 now, Jim. Oh, it is. Remember? It's not 256. Isn't it 512? It is. You're right. I'm sorry. Jeez. I, I am mistaken. It is 512. So, um, but I use this because in distributed systems, if you're just thinking about two shards of a database, that doesn't work, right? Like you're, you're, your granular level of understanding of the data is what's going to allow you to get this availability because we're going to combine this, right? This, this ranges of data within a table was something called raft. Now raft, we actually went through in the last session as well as a distributed consensus protocol. What it does ultimately, it provides atomic rights and consistent reads across groups of data. Now in raft, there is a thing called a replica set and you can configure raft to be, you know, a, a multiplication factor, a replica, replication factor of three or five or seven or nine, some odd number. Because ultimately, when you write data, you want a quorum write. Two of the three replicas have to say, I'm good, before the third one. And it's fine, because the, 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 the way that it works is that's it's quorum, right? And so we're actually going to write data three times using raft. 
And we're going to write data three times. We're going to write it in different spots so that if I lose a physical node of the database, I'm still going to have a copy of that database and hence the availability. You can't get to this without explaining how we're breaking down the data, right? Like if I had only two things and I only had two replica sets of these two things, I only have six, then I, you know, I, could, I, I wouldn't be able to survive things, right? And so the distributed nature comes back to basically the size of these, these little ranges that you have, the number of them you have, kind of crossed with basically the number of physical nodes that you could actually survive the failure of. And that ultimately is availability. So there's probably about 11 more things within Cockroach that actually contributed to this. But I, I think, you know, at the core, thinking through the way that we actually went about breaking down data and storing it using Raft is the critical part about the availability in, in kind of the way we did this and, and the brilliance and what this, what this team did. So, so Raft also has this concept of a Raft leader, which basically that is the, the, the authoritative source across this replicas, right? Like there's two followers and a leader and the, 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 the Raft leader always has the most recent stuff. If the Raft leader goes away, fails, that, that server rack that it was on just fails, well, the other two that are left are like, wait a second, we don't have a leader, let's nominate a new one. So they'll just create a new one and then copy the data over correctly, right? And so it's a chatty protocol. It uses this gossip, like they're all communicating to each other all the time. Like there's these heartbeats to make sure they're in sync and everything, right? And so um, if you wanna learn more, there's, um, I forget the name of the thing. Tim, do you remember the name Secret of Secret Lives of Data? The True Lives of Data, that's uh, right. Secret, Secret Lives of Data, True Lives Secret of Data? Secret Lives of like Data, that? that's right, yeah. Yep. Um, there's a pretty, awesome kind of um, uh, visual um, um, depiction of this. So, so there's a question that came through, how are these keys distributed between nodes? Is this part of Raft algorithm? Yes, I'm gonna go through that now, exactly how we actually then distribute this data across all of this, so. Yeah, and can I maybe just, uh, something I've been thinking about as you've been talking here, mm -hmm. it, maybe just to kind of set a higher level context. I mean, if you're new to Cockroach, this may not be super obvious, but you know, we're a distributed SQL engine, right? Um, as opposed to, I suppose, a, a distributed NoSQL engine. Um, and I think that's an important context, but we also implement something called the Postgres wire protocol. So people come to us and they're like, well, you're distributed, but you also implement Postgres, which is not necessarily distributed, which is it? You know, do you speak SQL or NoSQL? And I think, you know, we're, we're talking about these more detailed concepts because one of the things you'll often hear us say is we're the marriage of both worlds, right? The best of both worlds. You you get the scale out and performance of NoSQL systems, which are oftentimes massively distributed, but you get the correctness um, and language benefits of traditional SQL systems. And so that's why it's, you know, that's why Jim's going through this exercise of, hey, we're a distributed key value store under the hood, because we're, again, this marriage of two important concepts that ultimately results in something really powerful. I, I have a SQL language that sits on top of a distributed key value store, which, you know, gives us all these benefits. How we make that work is a lot of what we're going through. But uh, I think that's important. We're, we speak Postgres. We look like a traditional system. Behind the scenes, it's something very different and allows us to be not only highly available, but very performant and consistent and all the other stuff we're talking about. And, and it's a great point, Tim, because it's the challenge of this distributed systems and distributed thinking. You don't want to, like, change everybody's interaction with what you build. You, you want it to just work, right? And I think, you know, uh, you know, I think Peter Mattis was the one who chose the, you know, Postgres wire protocol at the very beginning. And, you know, it was a fundamentally like a, a incredible moment in time for the company because, you know, yeah, we could have built our own syntax and yeah, we would have right. built all these things into it. But, you know, ultimately I think the concept of distributed systems is take this complexity of scale, take this complexity of consistency, take this complexity of availability and actually build it into the system. Don't, don't architect, you know, active passive systems and like, I'm gonna have asynchronous replication outside of like, the concept in distributed systems is to work these things in your code, right? And, and don't rely on something else. And I think that's the, I think that's one of the big things that, that changed my, my belief in distributed systems as well. It's a, it's a, it's a really important point, Tim, thanks. So. So, so I was deep in raft and then Tim kind of distracted me, but that's okay. So break you out, out of that for just a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Know? It's okay. Somebody was asking us, you know, so how do we then, you know, place data on different physical nodes to make sure that, you know, we're going to survive region failures or we're going to have fast access. So this is all configurable in cockroach. Um, but ultimately this range thing and raft actually controls all this. It actually, 
you know, we're actually understanding where data lives. And, and when you think about these things, I think of either failure domains or gain domains is kind of what I think about it. Like, do you want to actually have better performance, lower latency? Do you want to survive the failure or something? And so I think it's one of these things that uh, you, you got to think through. Like typically when you implement it and, 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 and roll out a database, you think about the logical model, right? Like here's the tables, here's the referential integrity. Like, you know, it's the logical model, like whatever. In distributed systems, you have to think about the physical model as well. And physical model depicts speed and survivability. And, and I think if you just keep those two things in head, that's the kind of key around thinking through Jim, this. I, did we, or did you just coin a new phrase? I mean, we talk about failure domains all the time, but did you just coin the phrase gain domain? That's right, Tim. that's right, that's right. That's amazing, mm -hmm. I, I'm gonna mark that down. Live right here. Wow, right here, first time ever used. <laughs> hey, dude, I've been up for a long time, okay? So the gain domain, I love it, okay. So when we place data within physical nodes, we're basically just taking these replica sets, three copies, and we're gonna, I have four nodes here, we're gonna place it from a diversity point of view across four different physical nodes, or three different physical nodes, so that if one of these nodes fails, I'm still gonna survive. I'm still gonna have two or three of the copies. And we'll typically do this, we'll take all the ranges, we'll evenly distribute it. I think by default, we'll just evenly distribute from a storage point of view, this data across all the different nodes, but you know, Cockroach actually has implemented something. And this is kind of one of those cool distributed system thinking things too. Like if you're using distributed systems, think about workload as well, because you don't want hotspots, right? You don't want like one service to be overloaded and tearing down the machine when you have a bunch of other stuff on that. Can you actually take that, take heuristics off of that workload and separate it out into its own physical server? We're doing that within the database. We do it within, you know, the, the, this is a range because Muddy is the best dog ever created. That was my dog, by the way. It's super, super popular. So lots of people accessing that record. Can I segment that blue range off into its own nodes so that I can optimize performance? So optimize for storage, optimize also for performance in terms of, you know, CPU utilization as well. Um, kind of another interesting concept and something that's not readily apparent to people uh, until you start actually deploying systems into production. Um, but the same context that I'm talking about here in terms of our context as a database, you're gonna run into these things with just your computational services as microservices running Kubernetes or whatever, you know, whatever that is. And so um, these principles do apply and it's in the code where you're actually controlling these things. Uh, and then, you know, we also, there's a unique capability that we do, and, and this is really advanced stuff. And when I first saw this, I just couldn't believe what I was looking at. If, if you remember this kind of KV thing about the way that we store data, the key was, you know, table, key, column, right? And well, what if we overloaded the column with, you know, a, a country code or one of the values from the, 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 the table itself so that I can actually integrate in EU or US East or US West into that K. And now I sort all those records. Well, all the records that have this value of EU are all pulled together in one part of the table, right? And now I'm chunking out these 512 megabit ranges, Tim. Um, and now I have all the records that are EU together. I have everything US East together. I have now my ranges are basically geographic. I've taken this country code. And as long as I name nodes within this cluster, I can now place them in different locations. That's how we address things like low latency access. This is about availability. So you'd probably do a little bit more evenly distributed so that you know, you're know you gonna survive a regional failure, right? Because we can do that too, right? Because you wanna think about your failure domain. Is it a region? Is it a cluster? Well, if I had all my data in one region, I wouldn't. that data wouldn't be available. The, the, the availability thing for that data goes down, right? So. Again, this is the trade-offs between gain and pain here, right, Tim? Right, like the survivability and the and and the and the low latency stuff. So, yes. Uh, what's that, buddy? Sorry, I said yes. The gain domain. So, so let's just let's round this off. But how do we do this with databases today? I, the way that I've done with this with databases, you have a primary and a secondary. You have failover. You have this this asynchronous replication between the two of them so that everybody's always right into the primary and it's sending stuff over to the secondary. Um, and when something goes down, you basically will flip over to the secondary. Now there's some problems with this. It's costly, it's expensive. The synchronization is gonna result in some, some sync issues. When one system goes down and the other one is doing backup, 
Uh, you may have lost data in that time. What happens when both systems are back online? You have to mitigate and remediate the differences between the primary and the secondary, which is an absolute nightmare. Um, this whole remediation is, is, is difficult. It's like this, this is just a typical active passive backup. Well, in distributed systems, you don't have this. You have active, 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 like everything is active, right? All of your things, right? Like, and that's what you want from an availability point. You want active, active, right? You don't want like passive, is passive available? No, it's, it's that, that's what this is all about. Oh, and by the way, you have to survive regional failures too. So typically people will deploy this active, passive across multiple different regions. Um, again, when a region goes down, do you have availability for, for full time, right? And so within, within kind of an active, active database, these things become very, very different. Um, every node is an endpoint. Um, this eliminates any of this synchronization stuff that you've done. You can span, you know, multiple data centers and, and really the limitations are the speed of light ultimately. So if we kind of take a step back, we say, look at, here's all these records, these tables, I have it written across six different nodes. The Mueller record actually lives on three different nodes. Um, I'm writing data in triplicate. The cool part about distributed systems. And one of those things you want to think about is well, definitely with cockroach, every node is an endpoint. So I can ask any node for the data. I just put a load balancer in front of this and just start hitting every node. I'll be able to find the three pieces of data across the six nodes. So here I'm asking for Mueller. I'm asking this node here, the Schmidt, you know, it has Schmidt and Schneider on there, but doesn't have Mueller. It's smart enough to go find the, the leaseholder, right? The, the leaseholder of that RAF replica group to go get that data and return it. Same as uh, Wagner is happening from this other person. Right, so every node is an endpoint, right? Every node can service uh, consistent reads and writes. So again, from an availability point of view, this is actually pretty important. I don't have to go to the node where this data lived. I'm gonna get a response. I'm gonna get a response from, from every node. So my likelihood, if I had three nodes and one goes down, well, that's, you know, 30% chance I wouldn't get a response back. In this case, I have the data to respond all over the place. If one node goes down, well, okay, now it's one of six, right? I've just basically increased my high availability rate by actually just de delivering more nodes because I'm going to get a response. And remember the A in availability is I'm gonna get a response. The response may be like, I, I couldn't finish that transaction and that's okay too, that happens, but you're going to get a response, right? And so the nodes are kind of, in, the number, the sheer number is gonna increase your, your availability as well. It's actually a pretty key point and, and very much related to the, to the A here and the availability. Um, but then again, you know, we need to survive regional failure. So uh, what I'm doing is if I just evenly distribute data across all these nodes, you know, I'm gonna, it's more likely if I don't have, you know, all three copies of the node in any one region, I can survive the failure of that. And I'll just ask any node, I still have two copies left and I can still go get that data. So again, there's things that you can do within the design of your system to mitigate this availability thing. Look at what if two regions went down? Do I have access to that data? Well, I have one replica left. I don't have that. It's not, it's like, I can't commit that. I can't commit a transaction at that point. So there's kind of different things you have to think about. This is one of the reasons why we aren't hundred percent in A. We're pretty damn good. We could go pretty far, right? And that's why this range thing is really important um, when you start thinking about availability in your systems and how data works. Go on, Tim, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, you're making a really key point and one that I, maybe we don't spend enough time talking about, and that is probability. Right. Um, so, you know, if I have two of something, right, the chances of one of those going away becomes reasonably high, you know, but if I have three, five, seven, nine of those things, the, the, the chance that I have so many failures that I impact availability becomes dramatically low. I mean, almost approaching, you know, I, I'd never be zero, but you know, very near to zero, you know, particularly if, if you're deploying a, across multiple cloud providers or multiple, you know, regions within a single cloud provider, the likelihood that, you know, that a given cloud provider is going to simultaneously lose multiple regions is incredibly low. And therefore, you know, that's kind of what we spend a lot of time talking about is that although we are a CP system, meaning we are always going to serve correct data, right? Consistent data to be more specific in the in the, um, at, you know, in the, during the occurrence of failure. The reality is you can design these topologies such that even when failures occur, right, I'm still available and consistent. And I think that's the, you know, that's kind of the key point here is that you can begin to spread data around a cockroach cluster that if designed properly, um, 
you know, the, the chances of it reaching unavailability is right. so low that it's almost not worth worrying about. Yeah. And, and Tim, I think that's a key point. There's a couple of dials, right? Yeah. You know, how many nodes? And then this replication factor, like if I have three copies of data or five or seven, well, the, the likelihood of you losing, you know, four of seven copies is pretty low, right? Like, and so I, I, it's such a key, the probability thing is such a key thing to think about when you start thinking about availability and what you're trying, look at every workload is different. And it really comes down to what you want to accomplish, I think is the, the lesson that I've learned out of this whole thing, right? Yeah. And, you know, there's another thing, and, and maybe you cover this later, in which case I apologize for jumping the gun, but, um, you know, well, people then will look at this and say, well, geez, you know, this diagram here means I got to have a whole bunch of cockroach stuff to protect myself from, you know, availability. And that's true. But there's, it, this isn't without its benefit, right? I mean, you know, a, a traditional active passive system, well, it can mean a couple different things. It oftentimes means that I've got a bunch of unused hardware, right? And that I, you know, it's just kind of sitting around waiting for failure. Right. Um, and this, you know, the, the infrastructure, software, hardware to keep those two things in sync is often incredibly complex and expensive. You know, yes, you have to add more cockroach, but that more means I'm fully utilizing or can fully utilize my hardware across the, the cluster, which oftentimes leads to dramatically increased performance, not only high availability, but now I'm actually performing better than I was in these other systems. So, you know, moving the dial in these different directions is, as you described, you know, obviously impacts availability, but really, you know, can impact positively performance and all sorts of other outcomes that are generally important to people. And I think that's an important distinction because people kind of look at this and say, oh, geez, this is too much. Well, eh, go compare the TCO of something like this to what you're doing today and the risk you face today with more traditional systems. And I think you'd be surprised by the outcome. That's right, Tim. And I think it's, it, 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 come, it comes back to like, yes, this applies to us in a database, but this applies to the way that people think about designing systems, right? And like, that's what I mean. Like, this is the, the code base of, of Cockroach. And actually somebody was asking in the chat, like, where can I find something in the code base? It's a PhD in distributed systems in many ways, right? Like there's so many cool things that are done here that are applicable in other things that you are designing. We get into this talk a lot because I, I love it because I think it is one of the most valuable things we do because it, it helps everybody think this way and to start thinking about copies and probability and all these things. In reality, the pragmatic reality, there's a whole lot of cost with doing this another way, right? And so that's what you got. And, and I love your, I need more cockroach because I, 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 I got a fever, Tim. Yes. The only thing going to solve it is more cowbell. I'm joking, baby. So. There's been so much cowbell talk around cockroach in the last 72 hours. I'm not sure I can handle it anymore. Yeah. But you know, the other thing, and again, just because I think this is such an interesting diagram and, and it's one we talk about a lot, but um, there's another benefit, right? You know, we've talked about well, sure, we get some high availability. And oh, by the way, we may even get performance just because there's more things working on, on, on you know, your requests, you know, serving, serving your requests. But there's another thing here, and this gets back to all the detail we were talking about with, with replica placement and raft and consensus and all these other things. Um, and and that, that, the diagram that you showed about, you know, data living in different parts of the world. What this means too, by the way, is that when I begin to spread data out across these different failure domains, geographies, in this case, regions. My experience for someone who lives, let's say, close to region two is dramatically improved perhaps than an old model in which, you know, sitting in Portland, Oregon, I had to traverse the continental United States to pull data out of a database sitting in Virginia. And so, you know, there's lots of benefits to kind of moving data out toward the edge. It's high availability. It's raw compute and horsepower performance because I have so many of these things, but it's also just locality, location. You know, I get to read data that's much closer to where I am and write data to a data center that's much closer to where I am, uh, which again can, can lead to huge performance and throughput gains um, under a whole variety of scenarios. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what's going on, Tim. And I think people don't understand the complexity. Like, so, so you mentioned all these different things. So Tim, we, we talk a lot about, I don't even know how to frame this. I'm kind of leading, I'm leading the witness here a little bit. Uh -oh. you know, talk about topologies and you, you said this word a couple of times, right? And so like, what goes into that? Like, what, it, what are the dials that you're thinking about as you think about this, this physical nature of the data? I mean, all those things, right? 
Yeah, there's there's a lot to consider and, and has been historically a lot to consider. We have to understand where things physically exist. I mean, when I say right. things, I mean nodes. Like, you know, where do my nodes exist in the world? Are they in Texas and Virginia and what does that look like? Idaho, maybe? I'm kind of bad with the Pacific Northwest geography, by the way. But um, Montana, but it's cool. Is it Montana? Yeah. Well, anyway, um, so... So we need to just understand physical presence, right? But then we start to inform the cockroach database about where these nodes exist by, by using startup flags, for example. Yeah. But then ultimately we had this concept of, well, okay, I can partition my data based on, on, on some of these attributes and pin those ultimately partitions to different locations. It kind of became a complex thing or could be conceived as complex. And I think maybe where you're leading me here, even though I wish you weren't, was something, a big innovation, I think, that, that we're gonna be talking about in coming weeks, which is how we've really rethought and simplified um, multi-region ultimately yeah. within Cockroach. Yeah, and I think, you know, we did a lot of work in terms of helping people understand like, oh, I want, I want slow reads, but fast access writes. Like, and how do you design your database and your tables? And there's these different topology patterns that we outline in our documentation, which- yep. You know, again, I think our docs does an amazing job. It, it, to me, it's like, you know, I've worked in a lot of companies with bad docs. This, these docs are really fantastic. And like, if you look at the topology patterns in, in our, it goes into all these things in great detail. You know, for us though, you know, we, we want to make all these things simple ultimately. Like we want to break this thing down to a couple of declarative SQL statements. I'm not going to spend too much time here. I will ask you though, as, as we kind of hurdle towards 21.1 next Tuesday, um, give me a little sneak peek on some of the stuff that we're going to talk about. How do we simplify this down to a declarative language so that anybody can do this? A developer can do it from command line, right? It's just simple DML. I execute four questions and you're going to be great. Um, so next week, uh, you know, I'm at Cockroach Hour. I've got uh, Adam Storm, who's an uh, engineering leader here, and Andy Woods, who was the product manager who designed all this, who helped design a whole lot. Gosh, he did. There was a whole lot of people involved in this. We've taken all this, this complexity around availability and survivability and speed of access and broken it down to really four questions. And, and, and doing that, uh, it's some of the most proud work that I, th I think we've, we've done here as a company. And so I, this is a quick commercial for that uh, before we get into it, so. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a really, really exciting kind of development in Cockroach because hopefully what people are hearing and seeing when they, when they watch this is that you know, there's a lot of options here. I can I can deploy Cockroach in a single data center and it have certain characteristics. I can deploy it, you know, across the world and it have other characteristics. Yeah. Sometimes managing that can get complex and we've worked really hard to reduce that complexity through some of this innovation that you're going to hear about next week. Um, That's so right. it is, it's really, really exciting because people, this is what people want and people need out in the world. I need to run my database in a much more sophisticated way than traditional databases allow me to. Um, but I want to I want to do that with ease and predictability, and, and this right. is what I think is happening. And and, under, and understanding those concepts, you know, what is an AP? What is a region? What is a cluster? What is a cloud provider? And and being able to survive the failure of a cloud provider, could you do that? Yes. But the cool thing is, is being able to do it at the table level. Actually, going and saying like each table is different. Like you look at, I've got a bunch of like, you know, coupon codes that I just need fast access to that all over the planet. So I'm going to co I won't copy everywhere. You know what I mean? But like my, my German customer data, because of some privacy regulation, I want all that to just live in Germany because of privacy or like I need speed access to it in just Germany. I don't care about if they access it and they have a bad experience if they're in New York. And so like the granularity is not just at the top level, it is at the data, it's the row level ultimately. And I think, again, translating this back to just general kind of core principles of distributed systems and, and, and distributed mindset, really getting granular and actually understanding what you want to accomplish physically with data is the concept around distributed systems that I think that's, that's where stuff gets really, really complex. And, and I think, I think this is the the shift that we're all going through. I think there's this shift to cloud and all this transformation, whatever, you know, these new tools. But I'm I'm most interested to see the shift to distributed systems in the developer, in the developer mindset. I, this is this is the stuff that is super yeah, it's, to me. Yeah, and I think you know what we're finding is that that people, developers, application developers, DBAs, operational folks have, have maybe shied away from building applications that are are are, are truly global like this is or this allows yeah. you to do because it's just like to wrap your head around it is 
has been difficult to implement it at times has been really difficult. And that's why I'm really excited about the possibilities that this opens up because it gonna allow you to do things uh, with your database that uh, while uh, weren't necessarily impossible before were certainly difficult. And, and uh, this, is, uh, this is a big step forward we're excited about. Yeah, so next week in the Crocker Show, Adam and Andy, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that one. So, um, you know, I think Tim, we are at the end. I mean, you know, so, so look, like there's the theoretical concept of availability. So Tim, thank you for making it very real. I think, you know, I, I think these things are theories, but in actuality, this thing was proven because it's actually a thing. Like, and, and I think that's the, I, one of my favorite things about the cap theorem I mean, when I first got to choose, I was like, ah, if somebody can beat that. But you, you just simply, it's not possible. It, it's proven. And I think that's the, I think that's the thing. There's a, there's a pragmatic reality around these things, right? Yeah. So. And, and uh, you know, it's just been kind of reflecting on this all day. And I think, um, you know, when we get asked this question and, and people come to this conversation generally with this concept of high availability, but I mean, everything has to be highly available, which is good. It's right. It, it's, it's very much how we were trained to think about things for a long time. So when we enter into a cap theorem discussion and we tell people that we're actually CP, people are like, oh, well, geez, you know, I, I need a database that's always available. You know, that you're not right for us. But the reality is when you're talking about your system of record, when you're talking about a database, you want it to be consistent. You want it to be correct. And oh, by the way, and we guarantee that, right? Because we are a CP system. But oh, by the way, when deployed correctly, we're also going to be so extremely highly available um, that, you know, we're, we're going to have to near the world's end um, before, uh, before you start becoming unavailable with a proper it is, it cockroach is database. Cockroach and, database after all. So yeah, exactly. Hard to kill. Right. Yeah. And so I think, you know, to me, that's like, that's the important takeaway is people are often surprised that, you know, that we're not AP because we talk so much about survivability and availability, but reality is you want the database to always be correct but you want it also to be deployed in such a way that it's enormously difficult to kill. And that's exactly what we've done here. And I think it's, it's really exciting. And kudos to the team because these are incredibly complex problems to solve. Like this is next level stuff that I, you know, I find uh, really, really interesting. So, so Tim, along those lines, and one of the questions that came through, you know, some, we get this question, how many nines is Cockroach DB? How, how do you answer that when somebody asks you? <laughs> well, uh, how many do you want it? Right, exactly. You know, and that's not, that's actually not, um, uh, you know, that's it's not, not tongue in cheek, Tim. It's real. No, right? it, it, like, it's not. Right. It, it's not. It, it really, I, I hope what we convey here and, and in other conversations is that you can really design a, a, a cockroach topology to meet your availability goals, whatever they are. Um, and, and you do that largely by expanding the footprint of the cluster. Now, of course, ultimately, this is, will be dictated by the quality of the infrastructure that you choose, the guarantees that those providers are providing. But, you know, if it hasn't been said explicitly, you know, again, a, a topology pattern that we're seeing some of our largest customers adopt is something like five to seven regions spread across, obviously, different power grids. I mean, we actually talk about these things at Cockroach, like, de you know, deploying nodes across different power grids. Not deploying, not deployed in the same tornado alley. Yeah, you know, never, right? yeah. deploying nodes across cloud providers, you know, so that if Azure has a bad day or AWS has a bad day, which has happened, you know, the whole thing isn't going down. So, you know, you can really build and deploy a, a cluster, a topology uh, to meet whatever your survivability or availability goals are. We really do truly believe that. And then, um, I mean, Tim, it's, what your risk tolerance is for that workload and what your spend tolerance is. Yeah. And, and that, it's really like, it, it's, is it one size fits all? It is nope. absolutely not. And, and that, I think that's the beauty of this, but it's also a little bit of the challenge. And one of the reasons why, you know, we really seek to simplify these things. And, and one of the reasons I'm really excited about 21.1 next week is just because let's just greatly simplify this so that if you did want to do it, go for it. But tell you what, we're really good in a single region too. All this complex five regions Tim's talking about, that's all great. You know, what do you want to fail an AZ failing? Yes, I want to, I want to, I want to survive the failure of an AZ too. That's a single region. Now. Yeah. So, and I think thanks for saying that because I, I wanted to reinforce that point also. Sometimes when we get on these conversations, we we kind of over-rotate toward the complaint, right. like, hey, 
you know, you can build these wildly complex topologies and they're amazing and, and nothing can ever kill them. And you may be sitting here going, well, geez, you know, I don't quite need that yet. And that's fine too. I mean, you can build a simple cluster that exists in a single rack in a single region, heck in a right. single availability zone. What does that mean? It just means you're more exposed to certain um, uh, failures than, than other clusters are. And that may be perfectly fine for your workload. So I hate for people to, to listen to this talk and other yeah. talks and think, well, oh, geez, and, you know, it's like too I said, complex. The cool thing is, is the minute you want to scale, it's a simple VML, it's a couple C and, and you're good. You, you, the capability go. is there for you. Um, anyway, so so I, I, that, I think that I, I'm pretty sure. I, do you want to talk through this, Tim? Or I, I, think I'm, I'm, I think I'm done talking to you today. We talked through this last time. Why? You don't want to talk about more constraint triangles? There's, there's so many. <laughs> there's so many. We could talk about all there's kinds of them. Happy, sad, and like tired, I think, is my constraint triangle right now. Yeah, maybe. Um, well, thank you, Tim. That was another great discussion. Um, you know, the next one's going to be interesting because it's a combination of the two. And partition tolerance is going to be an interesting one. Um, for us to get into. That is uh, on June 16th. Um, we'll talk about that. So today was availability. This video will be up pretty soon. Uh, the consistency session for CAP theorem I thought was great. A lot more on the history up front, y'all. Mm -hmm. I, I find this stuff to be intriguing. So um, if you want to go check that out, that's off on our, in our, in our uh, YouTube page. Um, but we'll send follow-up an email um, immediately after this. Uh, JP does a great job of follow-up. Um, and I think that is, oh, and if you want to get started with Cockroach Cloud, please, gosh, by all means, go to cockroachlabs.com, get started with the cluster today. I am in marketing. I've got to do a little bit of an advertisement. Well, we did talk a lot about Cockroach today, but hopefully it was valuable in a way that, you know, we're, I, I like to present principles that, that may be applicable in the way that you're developing. Because um, we know that if we're helping you build distributed systems, you know, we're pretty confident. We've got a great database that, that mirrors the concepts that, that we see in these kind of distributed systems and, and kind of the, the modern infrastructure that's happening. And so, you know, it, for us, it's, you know, what's good for everybody is, is good. It's, 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 I, I want everything to progress. I love this stuff. So um, Tim, thank you uh, again, as always. Um, it's always a, a joy. I've been, I feel like I've been on the phone with you a lot the past 24 hours. So um, thanks buddy. It's a, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Yes. It it, enjoy it, Jim. And thanks to, to Michael who helped out on chat. Hopefully he, right answered some good questions. Looks like we had a, some good stuff there. Yep. That's great. So, and thanks JP for everything you do. Cause you're just, you're the best dude. You're the rock. So, um, and thank you everybody in the audience for, for sticking with us for the full hour. And I hope you have a great rest of the day.